D minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Engine ignition, lift off of the Falcon 9 rocket with science for today and for deep space exploration tomorrow. Falcon 9 has cleared the towers. Good evening, everyone. This is the post-launch news conference for our SpaceX CRS-8 CRS uh, mission tonight and uh, here to join us to give us a status on our launch and our mission is Kirk Sharman, manager for the International Space Station Program at NASA's Johnson Space Center, Elon Musk, the SpaceX Chief Executive Officer and Lead Designer, and Hans Koenigsman, the Vice President of Flight Reliability for SpaceX. And we'll start first with Kirk Scheinman. Kirk. All right, thanks. Uh, what a wonderful day. It's a beautiful day outside, a great day to uh, launch a rocket, and, uh, and we saw a great one. So uh, I had the, uh, the pleasure of being in the uh, Mission Control Center at, uh, at SpaceX, and, uh, and I can tell you the folks were really excited, uh, as were uh, myself and Bill Gerstenmeyer. Um, and, and then we could hear the roar of the rocket. That was really cool. Uh, so after, after the launch, I got on the phone and talked to our colleagues in Houston, and there was a roar there, too, so it was great to hear that. We're very excited to have uh, our, our cargo uh, and the Dragon safely on orbit, and we're very much looking forward to it to arrive to, uh, to the ISS. Um, I had a chance to speak to our mission control room in Houston, and uh, all systems on board the ISS are ready to support uh, the mission. And like I said, we're, we're looking great, uh, very forward to having the cargo and all the utilization on board ISS. Um, Tim Peak will be uh, grappling the uh, Dragon at 6.12 a.m. Sunday, Central Time. And uh, Jeff Williams will be assisting him, and those, uh, those crew members are ready to support that operation. And, uh, and like I said, uh, we're really happy to have, uh, have Dragon up in space, and we'll be even more happy to have it on board ISS. So let me hand it back to you, and we'll right. hear from uh, our SpaceX colleagues. All right. Thank you, Kirk. Now to Elon Musk, our SpaceX CEO and lead designer. Uh, thanks. Um, well, it's great to be here. Um, and um, just, to, of course, um, uh, we love doing doing a good job for NASA. So um, the, thank you for allowing us to deliver the cargo. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the uh, uh, yeah, I think the, the, the mice are doing doing well. That's what I heard. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure they're happy though. <laughs> they, 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 I think they might be a bit confused. Yes. Um, so it's probably not on their evolutionary path to be in zero g. But um, but uh, yeah, there's there's a bunch of astronauts on on board. Um, so uh, the, the the thing um, that uh, was a little different about this this mission on the rocket side was, of course, uh, uh, the the rocket landed instead of putting a hole in the ship. Um, <laughs> Or, or or tipping over, so um, so we're really excited about about that, and um, the, the the reason that that's really important is about half of our missions are uh, we'll, we'll need to land out to sea, so um, the, in any missions that are going to particularly to geostationary orbit um, or to escape velocity, uh, anything beyond Earth uh, would is is, is um, likely to need to land on the ship. Um, and I thought it would be worth just um, emphasizing that the, the reason for that is um, something that, that I think uh, it would be good for the, the press to educate the public about, which is the difference between um, space and velocity, uh, space and orbit. Um, like, arguably, the space station should be called the orbit station um, because it's actually zooming around the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour. Um, and it crosses the Atlantic in, I think, about 20 minutes or so. Pretty, pretty speedy, um, and that's that's for example why there's such a short uh, launch window is because uh, the rocket's got to get into orbit and kind of match the orbit with the with the space station, um, and it's 
it's moving so quickly that that orbital window is only open for a few seconds. Um, so although a rocket looks like it's, it's, going, it's going up because it starts off vertical, actually it's, it's going to very quickly turn and go sideways and go horizontal, and it's going to match that space station velocity of, of, of roughly 17,000 miles an hour. Um, so, uh, so, so basically the rocket at stage separation is zooming out to speed, at, at, at zooming out to sea at an incredible velocity. Um, and it doesn't have enough propellant uh, to come back, to, to basically zero out that velocity, boost back in the other direction, and then land. Um, so in order to achieve effective reusability, if you want missions to go to high orbit or to, to escape velocity, uh, you really need the, the ocean landing. Um, and um, I just wanted to make sure that was explained and uh, we can, you know, in the Q&A we can go maybe into a little more depth on that. But um, I think as, as, as things make progress, I think it, it is, um, uh, I, think, I think it would, would be good for the public to know uh, a bit about orbital, orbital dynamics because uh, it is a little counterintuitive. Um, so anyway. Thank you, Elon, and uh, another Hans Koenigsman, our Vice President for Flight Reliability. It's been yeah, I, I just can, can fill in a little bit on the on the Dragon side. Um, I, um, <clears throat> I talked to, to Mission Control on the way up. Um, all thrusters have been fired, so we know Dragon's healthy. It's a, it's a good spacecraft. Um, everything's working. Our flight computers are running. Uh, commons working. Communications working. Um, the uh, the next uh, the next thing that's going to happen is the opening of the GNC door, um, which which then will um, activate Star Trekker. That is going to happen in about uh, two hours and fifteen minutes, and then the first orbital um, adjustment burn is going to happen in uh, tomorrow morning. And docking with the space station then um, is currently planned for Sunday morning. It's I think six o'clock. Uh, early in the morning uh, at Eastern time. So everything is going well. It's an, uh, it's an awesome day. I think the team, you know, the, both on, on SpaceX side, on NASA side, and, uh, and, and also on the 45th side, um, worked, worked awesome together, and uh, we did a great launch. Thank you, Hans. And we'll take questions now. Please give your name affiliation when the uh, microphone comes to you. We'll start right here it's with uh, James here. Sorry. Sure. Thanks so much, James. Dean Flora today. Elon, um, do you think this booster, if it checks out okay, will be the first to refly? How soon could that be? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think that uh, that's likely. Um, so the, the, the plan is to bring this booster back. Should arrive uh, in port on Sunday, um, and uh, and then we're going to uh, do a, a series of, of test fires. Um, we're hoping to do that at the Cape. Um, rather than transport it to Texas and, and, and then bring it back. Um, so our, our thought is to, do, to basically fire it uh, 10 times in a row on the ground. Um, and um, and if, that looks, if things look good, at that point, uh, we feel it's uh, sort of uh, qualified for reuse in, uh, in, in launch. Um, and we're hoping to uh, relaunch uh, on an orbital mission probably around uh, May or June, so it's, uh, pretty soon. May, let's say June, if I recalibrate my timing expectations. <laughs> <laughs> I just clarify that. You're gonna, you could relaunch this booster within a few months? Yeah, yeah. But what, I mean, in the future, hopefully, we'll be able to relaunch them within a few weeks. Irene? Um, thanks. Irene Klotz with Reuters. Um, congratulations, first of all. And with this, uh, would that be a test flight, or would you hope to have a customer for that? And um, also, this is been kind of a long time coming for you. How do you feel about this? And were you surprised to actually see it stick the landing? Um, yeah. Um, I w actually, we, we were just talking yesterday. Um, went around the table and on odds for, for success. And um, the consensus was, was about two to one. So we, did, we thought it was more likely than not that uh, this mission would, would work. But still probably you know, one third chance of, of failure. Um, and, um, but we'd eliminated the reasons, the, the prior reasons. Um, so we, we were confident that if it did fail, it would fail for a new reason. Um, so as it turns out, there's a lot of reasons for rockets to fail. Mm -hmm. um, so 
Um, but this, this was a beautiful day, and I think every, the circumstances were, were, were good. Um, it's still quite tricky to, to land on a ship, and if you, um, you on the video, I mean, the ship looks quite small um, relative to the rocket, um, and uh, so, so it's, um, it's, it's quite a tiny target. It's really trying to land on a postage stamp there, um, and, and, the, and it's, a, it's a moving, sort of translating and, and rotating. It's sort of like a, like a carrier landing versus a, a land landing. Um, you know, it's a ti tinier spot, and it's, it's moving. <laughs> use of the, the reflux, would that be a, an actual paying customer on it, or would you do that uh, just as an experiment to relaunch it? Um, we think it'll be a paying customer, but, uh, but that's, we've we got to have some discussions. So, yeah. All right, let's go right here. So, Elon, having achieved this, uh, this milestone here, what does that mean for the future of SpaceX <laughs> and for the future of spaceflight? Yeah, I think this is... I think this is a really good milestone for the future of space flight. You know, I think it's another step towards the stars. Um, in order for us to um, really open up uh, access to space, we've got to achieve uh, full and rapid reusability. Um, and being able to, to do that for the, the primary rocket booster is, is I think, going to be a, a huge uh, um, impact on, on cost. Um, now it'll still take us, you know, um, a, a few years to make that smooth and uh, make it efficient. Uh, but it's, I, I think it's proven that it can work. Um, and you know, there probably will be some failures in the future, um, but we will iron those out and get it to the point where it's a routine. Um, it's routine to bring it back, and where the only changes to the rocket are, um, you know, maybe to. Uh, Hose it down, or you know, clean, <laughs> give you know, give it a wash, and um, add the propellant and fly again. That's the key. It's f full and rapid reusability is fundamental. Yeah. Bill. Oh, well, well Marcia was ahead of me. I let oh. Marcia go in front. Of me. Oh. Okay, Marcia, go oh, ahead. Um, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press for um, Mr. Musk. Um, where do you expect the stage that landed in December on land? Where is that going to end up? Is that going to be on display at your headquarters ultimately? Yeah, and exactly. soon, and hopefully. Ho hopefully, is yeah. that the plan? Uh, uh, we just got um, our headquarters are close to the, the or adjacent to the Hawthorne Airport, so we needed FAA permission because it would be like a the highest object for. Um, quite a distance around the, the airport, but we just, I believe, got that permission. So we're planning on putting the, um, the first, uh, the rocket that landed back at the Cape um, uh, in front of the SpaceX headquarters in, in Hawthorne, hopefully in the next few months. Oh, okay, thank yeah. you. And, and could you tell, what was the velocity and the altitude for this booster? Um, what's the highest altitude it reached in its peak speed before it started coming back? So, uh, actually, I, I, would, I, I don't actually know. <laughs> Um, 200 usually. Yeah, the the for for Leo missions, the peak altitude is usually not super high. Like it's it's would have been you know something around a couple hundred kilometers, um, and the the velocity also is not as high as as, as it would have been on the the last mission. The the highest velocity missions that we see are the the geostationary missions. Um, so so for example, for this mission, actually we we could have brought it back to land. Um, but we wanted to uh, do a do a ship landing where we had lots of lots of margin. Um, so it would have been a low margin return to land or a high margin ship landing. Um, and so this, I think, um, r really you know helped us show that the, sh the sh ship landing could work. Um, but in, in terms of the the maximum sort of transfer velocity, which is this, this is really the key figure of mer merit for the boost stage. Uh, the maximum transfer velocity is, is we, we think we'll, we'll get up to about uh, 9,000, maybe 10,000 uh, kilometers per hour. Um, and that's transferring um, an upper stage load, uh, upper stage with payload plus fairing, you're talking about 120 tons or thereabouts. So it's you know, 120 tons to upwards of 10,000 kilometers an hour. So it's sort of quite a javelin throw. Yeah. Bill? Yeah, Bill Harwood, CBS News. Two very quick questions. One is, I, I realize it was a fairly calm sea today, but those of us not looking, used to looking at barges in the ocean, 
looked like it was rocking pretty good. What is, just out of curiosity, the maximum tilt the rocket could stand and stay vertical, number one? Um, and two, can you talk a little bit about increasing your launch pace? You guys have a really busy manifest. You're starting to ramp things up here, and, and do you need more people? Can you do it with the crew you currently have here and at Vandenberg? Just, just generally about the pace. Thanks. Sure. Well, um, first of all, I'd say it, it's, it's, a, it's a ship. It used to be a barge. Um, but uh, when we added engines and control systems and everything, um, so now I, th I think it's sort of better cool with a ship. Um, has four engines. Uh, so, um, but uh, it, it, the, in, uh, today uh, the, the pitch and roll was about uh, two to three degrees, so it was actually not, not too bad. Um, in terms of maximum, uh, well, probably, you know, I'd say we could, we could do double, double that easily and maybe triple. <coughs> so maybe it's eight or nine degrees, but, but that, that's probably about the limit. Um, but that would be re really intense seas. Um, and um, you also see some translation where it's going up and down. So it's both rotating and translating. Um, so it's, it's, it's tricky, just, just like a carrier <coughs> landing. Um, but, um, but, but it's, I mean, and, and, and both are going to absolute position. So the, the, the ship is holding to absolute GPS position uh, with a relative GPS. And today was actually holding to with um, accuracy of, of below a meter. Um, and it's, it's, it's got four engines that all of which can rotate 360 degrees and they're operating continuously to hold uh, both the attitude and position in the, in the ocean um, and um, yeah in terms of um, increasing uh, our head count I think that's that's going to continue to grow um, and our launch rate is going to continue to grow um, we're expecting by um, you know maybe the third third or fourth quarter that would be doing a launch every uh, you know, two to three weeks. Steven? Thanks. Uh, Steven Clark from Space Flight Now. Um, a couple of uh, clarifications. Um, I believe earlier you've talked about securing the rocket on the drone ship with welded shoes. I was wondering if that's yep, still that's the... that's what's happening. That's still We're the welding plan. it down. <laughs> yeah. And Make uh, sure it doesn't tip over. There's, there's potentially some, there are potentially some heavy winds coming in. Um, so the, w once the rocket's safe, the crew's going to go on there, and then we've got these uh, steel shoes that we put over the landing feet and uh, weld it to the deck. And uh, it, uh, uh, one more clarification: Is it still coming into Port Canaveral? Is that the plan? Um, actually, I'm not certain about that. I think that certainly is where it will ultimately be. I'm not sure if that is the initial destination. Okay. All right. Let's come back over here onto this side of the room. Here. Right, right here. Oh. Okay. Uh, Sawyer Rosenstein with Talking Space, kind of going along with that, can you talk a little bit about the process of exactly how it gets, you know, to that drone ship, how it stays on that drone ship, and then the process of what exactly happens from now that it's on until it gets back into port? Sure. Um, we're, we're a little bit like the dog that caught the bus, you know. Um, <laughs> not, what do we do now? Um, uh, <laughs> but... but uh, it, it, the, the plan is to bring it into port, um, then take a, th there's, there's a load head fixture that we can put on the top of the, the rocket, uh, kind of where the, the stage separation mechanism attaches, uh, and then we, we can pick it up with the crane and then put it onto land. Um, and then we've got a, oh, we actually have like a, like a, like a, a stand that we put it on, and then we, uh, the stand attaches the, the launch hold downs, and then we can fold the legs up. Um, then the crane rotates it horizontal for transport and bring, should bring it to, back to um, probably 39A. Um, and then we're going to do some, do, do those, like those 10 test firings. And uh, if that all goes well, then uh, we think we'll be uh, comfortable with, with an orbital flight. Okay. Jason Ryan with SpaceFlightInsider.com, and I, I kind of want to take a back a little bit to Orbcom OG2 this past December. You successfully landed a landing zone one, kind of carrying out a test flight there, and today you carried out a test flight more or less on ocean. So can you talk a little bit about SpaceX's plans to actually incorporate its, the testing of its technology successfully, I might add, while still sending payloads to orbit? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure I totally understand the question. So. Um, 
You mean, um, I'm not sure I can understand the question. Incorporating SpaceX's technology to... Test flights while you're still sending payloads to orbit. I mean, you're, most oh, people, yeah. they break up their test program away from sending payloads to orbit, but you've actually managed to incorporate the two. Can you talk a little bit about that philosophy? Oh, um, yeah, sure. Well, I guess uh, um, if you, the, the, the problem with, uh, you know, as, as soon as you're going, going to orbit, um, your, your, your horizontal velocity, and like I really can't um, emphasize horizontal velocity enough. It's because um, it's so counterintuitive. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's super high. Um, so the, uh, you, it's really hard to do these test flights um, w without actually going to orbit. Um, like we, we could conceivably, I suppose, uh, put a, a huge weight, um, 120 ton weight on top of the boost stage. Um, and then and then do these launches, drop the, the 120 ton weight, and then try to land. Um, but but there's no point in doing that. Why not just send a useful payload while you're at it instead of the dead weight? So um, and but but that's why it's really hard to do these 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 tests. It's really basically impossible to do these tests on land unless you had like Siberia or something because it's just if, if if something were to happen and and the rocket uh, engines didn't relight, it would have a ballistic trajectory and land like hundreds of miles away, like several, like, you know, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 miles away. Um, so it could randomly smash down on, on a city somewhere. Um, that's why you need, you, you want to do the ocean um, launches. Um, so if, 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 if it isn't able to turn around and relight the engines, um, then it's it's going you know, to sort of smash into the ocean harmlessly. Yeah, we are taking questions from social media as well. If you use uh, hashtag Ask NASA, you can also ask some questions. Let's come here to the front to Daryl. Daryl Nail, Fox 35. Um, <coughs> this would seem like a big week for you, your car company earlier in the week, big uh, moment for your aerospace, aerospace company today. Can you kind of talk me through what that moment was like? Um, two questions. What that moment was like, um, where you were watching it, what you were feeling, uh, you know, did you turn and hug Hans or did you knuckle <laughs> bump him? <laughs> um, or, I, I, and have then, I have a confession to make. I, I did indeed hug Hans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then yeah, the tilt of the rocket when it came down. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it was, uh, I think the, the whole SpaceX team was super excited. Um, they've, they've all worked incredibly hard to uh, get to this day. And um, it's a lot of work ahead, for sure, because um, making the the landing and the reflight um, a, a, a easy is is hard, um, and um, r rapid and complete reusability is is the thing that's that's really important for the reusability to be cost effective, um, li like an aircraft. Um, so if if you know an aircraft, you can you can recycle a seven forty seven. Uh, that went from London to um, Los Angeles, and you can recycle that in three hours, two, three hours maybe, um, and, and do another flight. Um, we've got to ultimately get rockets to that point. Um, kind of explain. Oh, oh, the reason it's tilting right is because the it's the, it would actually it was quite windy. Um, so it, it had winds up to 50 miles an hour on, as it was coming, coming down. So it's tilting into the wind. Okay, question right here. Hi, Josh Jenner with TheOrbital.Space. First off, I just want to say congratulations. Um, secondly, I want to ask about the Falcon 9 Heavy. Um, given that it's going to be going further and faster, what will be the reuse capabilities of those stages? Falcon Heavy. I want to say, thinking about that, this is like quite a high, high Parker factor about uh, Falcon Heavy. Um, that That's, uh, you know, we originally, I mean, maybe we should have named it the Falcon 27. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we thought maybe that people might balk at that. Um, it's a lot of engines to work simultaneously, um, and um, and you have th uh, three times as many separation events. Uh, so uh, it's um, it's a lot more it's a lot trickier of a proposition than than Falcon 9. Um, but the payload capabilities are um, are amazing, and it's uh, it's got a lot of potential. Um, and um, yeah, and particularly for uh, doing the, the heavy high altitude uh, geostationary satellites. 
um, that, are, that currently can only be flown uh, by, um, by Ariane, like the, or you know, the, if, if it's a really heavy satellite. Um, good, yeah, so, so that's, um, th that's gonna be an important uh, mission for showing that we can, we can do the, the biggest satellites in the world and, th and then some. Um, if uh, Falcon Heavy, you know, if, if it reaches orbit, um, it, uh, it'll be the, uh, the biggest rocket to reach orbit since, um, well, uh, yeah, uh, well, since, since it, by, by thrust since the Space Shuttle and, the, um, uh, and Saturn V. And it'll be the biggest op operating rocket today until SLS is active. Um, so um, it'd be you know, load liftoff thrust approaching five million pounds. Um, Saturn V and the shuttle were about seven and a half. Um, yeah. Yeah, let's take a question here and then we'll do some social media. Yeah, J.D. Taylor with USA in Space. Uh, again, congratulations and also congratulations on your Model 3 launch as well. Uh, when, how often do you plan to do ground landings and when is the next one that you're going to attempt to do? Um, we, right now, the, we expect about half of our landings to be ground and then half uh, to be uh, uh, ocean landings. Um, and then o over time, we do want to, as we refine the performance of the rocket, um, and it can pr improve the, just all the elements of flight, um, and it's, it's amazing how sort of a few percent improvement here and there sort of adds up and, and then you're able to achieve enough margin to bring it all the way back to land. So we're hopeful that in the long run, we'll move from say half of our missions being ocean landing to, to maybe a, th a third of them or, or, or a quarter. Because um, it certainly is um, a lot easier to refly the rocket if it comes back to land. Um, and um, sorry, what was the other part of the question? The uh, just so I went in the, went in the next landing oh, next for... Um, Next land landing, I think it's uh, probably uh, about three months away. So the next one's another, another ocean landing. Um, it's two ocean landings, two geos, and yeah. then there's another CLS mission maybe that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably the most likely. So pr yeah, so pr probably the, the third mission from now will be um, a land landing. Um, and uh, the next two are um, quite high velocity geo missions. So these will be uh, quite tough ship landings because it's going to come in really hot. Um, in fact, the, the the thing about the high velocity reentries is that they're they're not just it's not just a lot of wind force, but it's a lot of heat, um, and that the heat goes peak heating goes with the cube of velocity. So, um, like the the way to understand the difficulty of achieving a given velocity is actually as the square because the kinetic energy grows as the square of velocity. Um, but then the, the peak heating goes grows as the cube of velocity, so it's really wants to melt. <laughs> yeah, I think we've got a question on social media. Can you give us that one? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of questions on social media. This one's from NASA Watch, and um, he wants to know how many times do you think you can reuse a used first stage? Um, I think uh, some some aspects of the the stage will have no meaningful. Life. I mean, they'll, they'll, meaning they, they'll, you could probably do them at 1,000 missions. Um, um, I think almost everything on the stage will be good for 10 or 20 missions. Um, and um, with minor refurbishment, you could get to 100. Um, this one is from Bart on, on Twitter, and they ask, can you, um, this might be for the NASA folks, can you talk about the schedule for the upcoming beam deployment on ISS? I don't know if there's... Sure. Um, so Beam's going to be installed. We're thinking about the 15th or 16th of, uh, of this month, so uh, relatively quickly after uh, Dragon arrives. There's a certain period for thermal stabilization once it arrives. And, uh, and then the inflation is probably not until the end of May, somewhere around the 25th, 26th of May. Um, there's a lot of work involved in, in preparing for that, and, uh, and we also want a, a, a good quiescent period on board International Space Station. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, this is we've had four visiting vehicles. Uh, this will be the fourth in four weeks. So uh, we need a time when vehicles aren't coming and going. It turns out there's a high um, sun angle in the end of May, which vehicles can't come and go at, during that time, and so it'll be a great time to inflate beam. So we're expecting expect about the 20, 25th or 6th of, uh, of May for inflation and, like I said, uh, tax day for, uh, for installation on uh, ISS. 
Hey, let's come up here and take a question right, right here in the front. Hi, uh, Thaddeus Cesari with the Utica Phoenix. And for Elon, I was wondering if you foresee any competing launch providers following suit with reliability or reusability, and was that a hope of yours? It is. And what kind of edge does reusability give you over your competitors? <coughs> I, I think um, I, I'm hopeful that the um, other launch providers will head in the direction of re reusability. Um, I think it's it's quite it's quite fundamental. I mean. It, it's just as fundamental in rocketry as it is in other forms of transport, um, such as cars or planes or bicycles or anything. Um, the the cost to refuel our rocket um, or reload, it's actually mostly oxygen on board, um, is only about uh, two to three hundred thousand um, dollars. But the cost of the rocket itself is sixty million. You know, it's kind of like a an aircraft. Um, aircraft are real expensive, but not to buy, to, to construct and, and buy, but uh, not expensive to refuel, relatively speaking. So um, so it's really quite fundamental. Like the, the potential, if you've got a, a rocket that can be uh, fully and rapidly reused, um, it's somewhere on the order of a hundredfold cost reduction in, in marginal cost. You still have your fixed cost, but in, in marginal cost, it's a hundredfold reduction. Jereni Mom with CNN. This is for Mr. Musk. Congratulations. And um, is there anything that you and your companies are working on that can top the experience that you've had today? <laughs> um, well, this is a good one, for sure. Um, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about you, Hans, but I mean, I, I think the getting to orbit for the first time yeah. was. Uh, I mean that was probably the best one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, way back up through 2008, we, we managed to do three launches, but they they failed. Um, and I actually only had the money for for three launches, but we managed to. That was the, the original plan. The well, th after three, if we haven't succeeded, well, we, you know, maybe that 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 should be that that's it. Um, but we managed to scramble and put together the parts for one one final launch, and and it worked. Um, so that launch four of Falcon 1 was, I think, the most profound. Um, and then, um, and then, you know, first launch Falcon 9, first launch Dragon, for t bringing Dragon back. Um, landing back at the Cape, um, I, I'd say for landing, landing back at the Cape was next best after just getting to orbit in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and for, for, as for things in the future, um, we, we I think we'll we'll be successful, ironically, when it becomes boring, um, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so when it's like, oh yeah, another landing, okay, uh, no news there. That's um, that's that's actually when it will be successful, um, and um, you know, there's still there's still you know a few more things we want to do. We want to try to um, <coughs> bring the fairing, the the big nose cone back, um, and. Um, that that'll certainly help because those each of those cost several million, um, and um, you know Falcon Heavy should be quite exciting. Um, seeing three boosters come back. Okay, let's take a question right here. Mark Gotch, historical space imagery. Elon, congratulations uh, once again. You have proved to the world that you can land your rockets, whether it be on land or on a drone ship on the water. But looking forward to this future, looking at your rockets being recovered and being reusable, looking at your success with the Dragon capsule in terms of its abort test, protecting astronauts' lives for the future, looking at coupling that with your rockets, we see the foreseeable future of manned spaceflight at a very economical rate. Can you tell me, you pursuing more landings on water versus land, when will you begin to go forward to your future of manned spaceflight? Well, the, the first uh, 
uh, test flights with, with astronauts um, working with NASA, hopefully that first flight will occur towards the end of next year. Um, and uh, so that's going to be real exciting. Um, we're nearing the completion of uh, Dragon 2. Um, and we'll, um, we'll first do an unmanned test flight and then, uh, then add crew. Um, and we, we obviously want to be super careful and, and make sure that things are uh, as safe as they possibly can be. Um, but yeah, it, it could be as soon as uh, next year that, that we do the, the first crewed space flight. Um, and you know, I just also just like to take a, a moment. Um, you know, I, I, the SpaceX has got uh, five five thousand people, and um, <laughs> I get a lot of attention, but uh, it's they really did the work. Uh, is it true you are a success right across the board? And again, as you say, you couldn't have done any of this without your dedicated people. Yeah, it's an awesome team. Thank you, sir. Thanks. All right, let's. Uh, Take a couple on the phone here. Chris Ryan from the, the or Chris Davenport from the Washington Post, I think, is on the line. Mr. Davenport, your line is open. All right. Uh, any others on the phone? Okay, Ryan Ruggiero. Mr. Ruggiero, your line is open. All right, let's come back here. We'll take about two more questions, and that'll wrap us up. Any more over here? All right, well, we got one over here. Um, Robin Simangle with the New York Observer. Um, Elon, you always uh, mentioned that reusable rockets is a uh, the long-term goal of that is to make colonization on Mars cheaper yeah. and sustainable. Can you give us an update uh, on Mars and the company's plans, long-term plans? Well, I think probably um, you know now is not not the time to give give a, a sort of a full update. Um, I am planning on giving a talk at the International Astronautical Congress, which will be in Mexico this year in September, and um, I thought that would be a good venue to. Uh, describe what we think would be a good approach, something that would, would be effective for establishing uh, a city on Mars. Um, I think it's going to sound pretty crazy, um, so it should be at least entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, we're going to wrap up our launch coverage here for SpaceX CRS-8, and uh, hopefully you'll look forward to our grapple coverage uh, coming up on Sunday morning. So with that, that will conclude our briefing. Thank you very much.